we welcome you this evening to our Good Friday service here at Crozet United Methodist Church. I'm Sarah, the pastor here, and we are grateful for you to take the time and join us as we remember and lament and choose to be present with our Lord and Savior on the day and the evening when we remember his ultimate sacrifice for not just us, but all people everywhere. And so as we begin this evening, we're going to invite you to stand as you are able as we join together in the call to worship that you will find on your screens. <laughs> then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mitzvah and Jeshana and named it Ebenezer, for he said, Thus far the Lord has helped us. Please remain standing as you are able as we join together in our opening music from the United Methodist Hymnal number 285 to mock your reign, O dearest Lord. <laughs> join together in the gathering liturgy which you will find on the screens. With stones, God gave the people the law to guide and guard them from their sinfulness, but they chose to make an idol for themselves. Lord, have mercy. With stones, the Israelites built altars to other gods and worshipped them. Lord, have mercy. With stones, God's people enacted vengeance upon those who had sinned and took their lives in wrath. Lord, have mercy. Like a stone became the hearts of God's people as sin became the way of life. Lord, have mercy. With a stone, our Lord's body was sealed in the tomb after sacrificing himself for all people, for all time, that our sin should not overcome God's love. Lord, forgive us all. Let us join together in our unison prayer. O oh God, forgive. Our sins are too numerous to name. Our failures are too vast to encapsulate. 
Our waywardness is a highway paved with stones of anger, vengeance, hatred, and violence in word and deed. Call us back to you. When you seek for your lost sheep, we are found. You make our path straight and lead us home to your ever-loving heart. Conquer our hearts as you gave yourself up for us. We now give ourselves over to you in repentance and regret. We see your cross and envision our own, for it was us who sinned and not you. Yet your love is so vast and profound that you would die that we might live. You who were without sin should take the place of sinners. There are no words worthy of expressing that unmerited favor. So we in humility pray, thanks be to you, almighty God. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture this evening is one of the four depictions of the crucifixion from the New Testament. Ours comes to us from the Gospel account of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 32 through 53. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. From top to bottom, the earth shook and the rocks were split. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. This is a very difficult day for Christians. There are those who wish to pass over this like God passed over God's people in Goshen in the land of Egypt because it is a difficult and hard and sorrowful thing to consider why we are here. And yet we look at a cross every time we gather in this space for worship. We see crosses that adorn those who declare to the world that they are Christ by wearing the cross. We see the cross in so many places. But today is a day where we don't like to see it because today reminds us that the cross was necessary. Today reminds us that it wasn't the cross for Jesus, but our cross. It was ours to bear, but our God loves us so profoundly that he would bear it for us in Christ Jesus. And so we hear each time we gather on Good Friday which oftentimes is mistaken for Black Friday. Seems odd that we would call this Good Friday. It wasn't good for Jesus. 
but it is the greatest thing to happen for us. And here we gather and we hear different accounts of how it happened. Some of them are much more focused on the pain and suffering that Jesus had all throughout this day and also through the six hours he spent on the cross. Some of them are more focused, as Matthew is, on what people were saying to him and about him while he hanged there. And others still are focused on the fulfillment of that paschal lamb that was given first in the book of Exodus to God's people to mark them that they would be saved. And so it is that we are marked. We have been marked to be saved. Not because we have painted our thresholds with the blood of the lamb, but because we believe in the salvific power of God's sacrifice. It is only by our faith that we are saved. But today we're going to focus on the last part of what happened when Jesus breathed his last. The curtain was torn in two in the temple, and curtains were used to divide God's people. In the outer area, it was to divide women and foreigners from men. But the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, also had a curtain. And there it kept God in, that God would not lash out. The Old Testament is filled with those stories, those kind of bizarre stories of somebody inappropriately touching one of God's possessions, leaning against the ark when you shouldn't, or touching something when you are unclean, and God's power lashes out. And then there are plagues, and there is suffering and death, and so that curtain was meant to be a safety net to protect God's people. And throughout the ages, many a scholar and many a believer have argued over which curtain was torn. But it's not the tearing of the curtain that even interests me this evening. It is the breaking of the rocks. Rocks are a very important image in the Bible. We began our worship this evening by talking about the prophet Samuel building what we know as an Ebenezer. But in Hebrew, it is stones of help. That there, by piling up stones, he was marking a place where he and others could experience God's help. And throughout the scriptures, people use stones for good and for bad. When the Israelites cross into the promised land after they walk on dry land through the River Jordan, one of the first things that Joshua does is have them pile up 12 rocks, one for each of the tribes, to mark the place where this incredible thing happened. In fact, God often instructed the Israelites and those that would worship after them to make altars of unhewn stone to pile them up, not to focus on carving them, because often we get distracted by the carvings and start to make our own images in them, but to have just the rocks as they are and to place them, and then there we can make our offerings. But rocks are also weapons in the Bible. David uses them to conquer Goliath and to fend off the Philistines. Many a person feels righteous in taking a rock and stoning people to death in the Bible. And oftentimes in the Bible, rocks were hurled at others in warfare and in retribution. But then Jesus comes and transforms our understanding of stones and rocks. When we first started translating the Greek from the New Testament, it was translated that Jesus was a carpenter. Isn't this the carpenter's son? But actually, a better translation of that word would be builder. And it's more likely that Jesus worked with stone. He doesn't spend hardly any time talking about woodwork, but he spends a lot of time talking about stones. He says to Peter, you are the rock upon which I will build my church. He says of himself, I am the cornerstone that the builders rejected. He looks at the temple and he says, I can tear this down so that not one stone remains and yet rebuild it in three days. Spends a lot of time talking about stonework. 
leads you to believe that Jesus knew the weight and the heft of rock and that it could be something permanent, but it can also be transformed. And if you've ever had the occasion to journey to a place where rock has been carved away, sometimes by millions of years of water, you know that not even rock is impervious to change, that it too can be transformed. I remember as a little girl going to one of my friend's houses and she had gotten one of those rock tumblers for her birthday. It was not on my birthday list, but she was very excited. And she laid out all of these rocks and said, we're going to make these into something amazing. Are we? What are we going to do with these rocks? To me, they looked like the pea gravel that my parents had in front of their house. What are we going to do with this? And then in utter amazement, I watched as she put them in the tumbler and turned it on, and you could hear the racket it was making as the rocks tumbled against each other and the inside of the cylinder. And this went on for far too long. And then she took the end off and poured out the rocks. But they weren't rocks anymore. They were gemstones. They had been transformed by the collision and by the work and by the turning and the reorienting. They had been transformed. And I was utterly amazed that something so hideous could become something so beautiful. And then she proceeded to make them into jewelry. And I remember she was giving jewelry to her friends who came to her birthday, that we would remember that transformation. Now, that was a very long time ago, and I have since lost that piece of jewelry. But I have not lost the impression that that transformation made. At his death, rocks were transformed. And if you grew up hearing the song, Here I Am, Lord, you remember the verse that says, I will break their hearts of stone and give them hearts for love alone. We sing this oftentimes in United Methodism, especially in the Virginia Annual Conference, when we are ordaining new people, commissioning provisional elders and deacons, and licensing people as licensed local pastors. We sing this song. And it causes a lot of people to cry. It causes people to stop and say, is it I, Lord? Are you calling me? And to what have I been called? And some of us will spend our whole lives trying to get God to definitively answer that. Who am I and what are you calling me to be? But perhaps the one definitive thing that Good Friday reminds us of is that God is calling us to have transformed hearts. We are the spiritual descendants of a people who were known to be stiff-necked and hard in heart. And to learn to bow our heads in humility. And to learn to have our hearts perhaps not broken and shattered, for we are already a broken people but to have them transformed. That perhaps the almighty hands of God are able to reach down into our being and to take our hearts of stone and like that rock tumbler, turn them over in grace and forgiveness and in love. Help us to ponder and to consider. Help us to use the gift of reason in our experience combined with our exploration of the scriptures and the tradition that we have inherited from Christians going all the way back to the original apostles, to take all of those things and allow them to become the other rocks in that tumbler that are reshaping us and helping us to be transformed. Because they took Jesus out to a place that was high on the rocks, And they took him out on that place that other people would see. They wanted everyone to see so that they wouldn't do what he did. But what did he do? 
He didn't plan a coup. He didn't lead a revolt. He didn't murder any Roman citizens. He certainly didn't openly defy Caesar or Pontius Pilate. What did he do? And the answer is nothing. He didn't do anything to warrant that death sentence. But over the course of our lives, we have done so much. We have done things and said things that built up our own altar. We have not done and said things that we were called to do in Jesus' name. And we have torn down the Ebenezer's of others. But today, we have an opportunity to build something new. Hopefully, when you came in, you had the opportunity to pick up one of those stones and to hold it in your hand and feel its weight and to know that it wasn't just your stone of sin, but every sin ever that built up that cross. And Christ walked that path of suffering and allowed himself to die, not that we would suffer and die, but that we would help others end suffering and know that death will never be our end. He promises that new life is coming. And we can only have new life if we have a new beginning if we are transformed, if we take our hearts of stone and we allow God through our offering to wash them and shape them and repurpose them so that when they are back within us, we are no longer a people who are constantly sinning, but a people who are constantly blessing through the same love forgiveness and grace that we have received that is changing our hearts. It's this transformation that is key on this evening. Things changed when Jesus was born. And things changed throughout his earthly ministry. And even when he began his earthly ministry... The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us that stones were part of the testing. Jesus, who had been fasting for 40 days, was then invited by the devil in the story to take those stones and make them bread. Take them and make them bread so that you will eat. And Jesus refused. He refused to use his miraculous power for his own benefit. But he'll use it for ours. And then the devil takes him to the pinnacle of the temple in the holy city of Jerusalem and says, throw yourself down. For God will send God's angels so that you will not be dashed against the rocks. And again, Jesus refuses. It is that experience that they are mocking, unbeknownst to them, when the chief priests and the scribes and the elders and all of those people who are passing by and camped out to watch the suffering of our Lord, what they say when they say, come down from there, come down, save yourself. But Jesus doesn't need saving. It's us who needs the salvation. And so we come here with this mantle of sadness over us, this shadow of the cross, and it's hard not to be sad. And I'm not here to cheer you up. But I am here to remind you that just like the weight of the stone that is in your hand, that the weight that you bear because of your sin can be released. It can be turned over. You can give those things over to God and God gives you back newness, transformation, forgiveness, liberation, 
You are not shackled to the sins of your past. You are not in perpetual bondage to the sinfulness of your hearts. You can be free. And while there is nothing we can do this evening or over the course of the next year before the next Good Friday to change the necessity of the cross, it just might be the start of a new beginning for us where we can invite a more deep, profound transformation, not only of our hearts, but of our heads and the way that we live in this world so that next year, maybe there are more who have experienced our transformed hearts, no longer of stone, but of Christ. And next year, there may be more who mourn alongside us this day, but who also live in the hope of Sunday. In a moment, you are going to have an opportunity to consider what it is that is weighing you down. And for some of us, it is just the culmination of our sin. For some of us, it is our brokenness, maybe in body or mind or spirit. For some of us, it is that, like the curtain in the temple, we have parts of our lives that have been torn asunder, that have not found the richness and the wholeness that God yearns for us. Whatever it is that we are mourning, God says, give it to me. I have carried your sin and your guilt and your death. I can take whatever you want to give me. God can bear all of our concerns, our heartaches, our worries, our guilt, our sin, our regret, and our repentance. For God is a mighty God. And God can handle all of those things whatever it is that is weighing you down. God invites you to come. And Jesus reminds us that it is not your sacrifice, but your desire to heal your relationships that God encourages. Leave your sacrifice at the altar and go and repair those things, says Jesus. And tonight may be the first step for us in repairing what has been broken sometimes by our sin and sometimes by the sin of others. But tonight is an opportunity to leave it all at the cross. It will be metaphoric, but we also worship a living Savior who says, ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door will be opened. Seek and you shall find. Leave your burdens and I will set you free. So as we have this time this evening together, there is no time limit, there is no rush. You're going to have the opportunity to be here in the presence of God the Father, a piece of whom dwells here in this consecrated space. You have the opportunity to be here in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who promises us that wherever two or more have gathered in his name, he is there also and we have met that threshold. But we are also here in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Those of us who have been baptized, who received that portion of God's self, and those of us who regularly ask for God to be with us and present, and the Holy Spirit comes, we will again ask for our triune God to surround us with the love and the assurance that we need this evening that we too might be carried through to Easter. So let us pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is through your combined efforts that we are here. We have been created in your image. We have been sustained throughout our lives, and we have been redeemed. And now we ask for transformation that the ones who have created and sustained and redeemed us would again work a miracle. Transform our hearts. Help us to know that the words of the scriptures are true, 
that you are able to tear down and build back better, that you are able to mold us like a potter, that you are able to transform, to give us newness, not just in name, but in all that we are. For before we were anything, Lord, we were yours. And we are yours now. And may we come to know with great assurance this evening that we are yours forevermore. And so we will come to you in this eve of remembering your sacrifice. We will come before you and we will lay our burdens at your feet. We will come before you, almighty God, once more in our hearts, with our bodies, and with our troubles. And we will come to you seeking what so many did in the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, seeking your presence and your forgiveness, your acknowledgement of us, that we might know that you are our God. Because when we recognize this, Lord, we have come to discover that we can do all things. For in our weakness, your strength is made known. So as we hold these stones, Lord, know that we will never throw them, that we will not hurl them at others, but instead we will transfer what is holding us back onto them. And they will become an offering that we lay at the foot of the cross that you will receive them as you have received us, and that you will liberate us once more, not just from our sin, our guilt, and eternal death, but that you will liberate us to live new lives, transformed from the inside out. Thank you for this time with you and with one another. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for not leaving us, but coming back on Easter. But in this meantime, hold us close. Help us to realize that we are not beyond salvation and that we are yours. May it be so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. During this time of meditation and prayer, we're going to have the opportunity to hear an incredible musical offering by our chancel choir. And so I'm going to invite them to enter into this time with that gift.
you are invited to come forward when you are ready or as you feel led. You may kneel at the altar rail in prayer. You may take a seat further up if it is more comfortable for you. But when you are ready, we invite you to take these stones that you have covered in prayer and in your presence and lay them at the foot of the cross that in doing so you might find a liberation deep within your spirit and an acknowledgement that Christ came for us all. Please come as you feel ready and let.
Let us pray. It is with deepest gratitude, everlasting, almighty God, that we are here. You have removed from us our burden. You have received what we have had to give. And we recognize now that the weight that we bore, you willingly took upon yourself. May we find the ability to stand before you and to go forth in this world to love and serve, forgive and share the good news that we who were once dead and sinners are now forgiven, loved, and free. Thank you for the things for which there are no words. And thank you, Lord, for being here with us this day even when we could not be with you that fateful day. You continually come to us, not only in our hour of need, but in when we desire to draw closer to you. And for this, our spirits rejoice, even in the midst of the sorrow of this day. Thank you. We love you. Now and forevermore. Amen. We are going to invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, number 286 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Before I give you the benediction, I invite you to hear these words of John the Baptist that he spoke to those who gathered at the river to be baptized. Or not. You don't have them. 
Well, then now we'll have to find them, for they're kind of important. John the Baptist said this, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our spiritual ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. As you prepare to leave this place, may you have great hope, even in the midst of sorrow and mourning that if God can take stones and raise up children, imagine what God can do with you. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one now and forever. Amen.